My dear brothers and sisters, how grateful I am for this marvelous, for the marvelous messages of this conference, and for my privilege to speak with you now. For the more than 36 years I've been an apostle, the doctrine of the gathering of Israel has captured my attention. Everything about it has intrigued me, including the ministries and names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their lives and their wives, the covenant God made with them and extended through their lineage, the dispersion of the 12 tribes, and the numerous prophecies about the gathering in our day. I have studied the gathering, prayed about it, feasted upon every related scripture, and asked the Lord to increase my understanding. So imagine my delight when I was led recently to a new insight. With the help of two Hebrew scholars, I learned that one of the Hebraic meanings of the word Israel is let God prevail. Thus, the very name of Israel refers to a person who is willing to let God prevail in his or her life. Imagine my delight when I was led recently to a new insight. I learned that one of the Hebraic meanings of the word Israel is let God prevail prevail. Thus, it is important to remember that while we, we revere Joseph Smith as a prophet of God, this is not the church of Joseph Smith, nor is it the church of Mormon. This is the church of Jesus Christ. He decried exactly what his church should be called. Quote, For thus shall my church be called in the last days even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints." Close quote. I have spoken previously about a needed course correction in the way we refer to the name of the Church. Since that time, much has been done to accomplish this correction. We have gone to these extraordinary efforts because when we remove the Lord's name from the name of His Church, we inadvertently remove Him as the central focus of our worship and our lives. When we take the Savior's name upon us at baptism, we commit to witness by our words, thoughts, and actions that Jesus is the Christ. To help us remember him and to identify the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the Lord's Church, we are pleased to introduce a symbol that will signify the central place of Jesus Christ in his church. This symbol includes the name of the church contained within a cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. At the center of the symbol is a representation of Torvaldson's marble statue, the Christus. It portrays the resurrected living Lord reaching out to embrace all who will come unto him. Symbolically, Jesus Christ is standing under an arch. The arch reminds us of the resurrected Savior emerging from the tomb on the third day following his crucifixion. This symbol should feel familiar to many as we have long identified the restored gospel with the living resurrected Christ. Because of Jesus Christ, we celebrate Easter, and Easter is all about peace and hope. As followers of Jesus Christ, living in a day when the COVID-19 pandemic has put the whole world in commotion, let us not just talk of Christ or preach of Christ or employ a symbol representing Christ. Let us put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ into action. As you know, 
Members of the church observe the law of the fast one day each month. The Savior himself declared that certain things go not out but by prayer and fasting. Now as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and an apostle of Jesus Christ, I know that God has all power, all wisdom, all understanding. He comprehendeth all things and he is a merciful being even unto salvation to those who will repent and believe on his name. So during times of deep distress, as when illness reaches pandemic proportions, the most natural thing for us to do is to call upon our Heavenly Father and His Son, the Master here, to show forth their marvelous power to bless the people of the earth. In my video message, I invited all to join in fasting on Sunday, March 29th, 2020. Many of you may have seen the video and joined in the fast. Some may have not. Now we still need help from heaven. So tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, in the spirit of the sons of Mosiah who gave themselves to much fasting and prayer, and as part of our April 2020 General Conference, I am calling for another worldwide fast. For all whose health may permit, let us fast, pray, and unite our faith once again. Let us prayerfully plead for relief from this global pandemic. I invite all, including those not of our faith, to fast and pray on Good Friday, April 10th, that the present pandemic may be controlled, caregivers protected, the economy strengthened, and life normalized. We unveiled a new symbol signifying our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and for visual recognition of official church information and materials. We have called for a global day of fasting and prayer that the present pandemic may be controlled, caregivers, caregivers protected, the economy strengthened, and life normalized. This fast will be held on Good Friday, April 10th. What a great Friday that will be. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, when we will again commemorate the atonement and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his atonement, his gift of resurrection will come to all who have ever lived, and his gift of eternal life will come to all who qualify by fidelity to ordinances and covenants made in his holy temples. The many inspiring compliments of this April 2020 General Conference and the sacred week that we now begin can be summarized by two divinely decreed words, hear him. We pray that your focus on Heavenly Father who spoke those words and on his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, will loom largest in your memories of all that has transpired. We pray that you will begin anew, truly to hear, hearken to, and heed the words of the Savior. I promise that decreased fear and increased faith will follow. Travis Wingate style. Well, today, Mormons are unaware that uh, it is Orthodox Good Friday. As Mormons might be aware, because Nelson tells them, the Reformed Christian churches, along with the Catholic Church of the Vatican, celebrate Good Friday last week. It's a whole different Passion Week between Reformed Christianity and Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity involves your Eastern uh, Christians, so all of your Eastern European Christians, including Russia. There's a conflict going on with that particular uh, Russian uh, leader and uh, others involved, as well as the Greek Orthodox. We have uh, Greek Orthodox here in Utah, for example, and they will be celebrating Good Friday. I did a video, my one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, a Greek Orthodox lady 
in Egyptian class, for example. Nobody cared, because nobody understands that there are other religions with other kinds of Christs. Mormons think that there's just Jesus, just like Reformed Christians. But Orthodox Christians, likewise, believe in the Constantinian Jesus, the rite of Constantinople. And so, uh, your Orthodox, uh, let's see if they get into, uh, they say it's based on holy tradition, they might as well just say Constantine. <clears throat> Established by Jesus Christ in his great commission. Uh, no, they're claiming Bible, but it's Constantine and his uh, Nicene Creed from which they're actually referring to here. And I'm not seeing... Uh, let's see... The churches of Constantinople, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch, except for some breaks of communion, such as the uh, Phocian Schism, which uh, occurred in 863, uh, the Acacian Schism, which occurred in 484 CE, uh, East-West Schism uh, was the 11th century, so the 10,000s, I see 10,054, or 10,154, uh, but yeah, all of this is after Constantine when they occurred. And so I did have one person involved with the Eastern Orthodoxy who made a comment declaring that they never followed Constantine. <laughs> uh, you got to know your church history, because they will lie. Church histories are the one thing that churches love to lie about its origins in order to claim that they're the one true church and thus cause holy wars and so uh, it, it's interesting because uh, Nelson adheres to the reformed Christians and their Passover and their Jesus Etc. Except for our Jesus is not Trinity. Nelson follows the tradition that uh, the Joseph Smith history is literal history. And therefore Jesus is of the congregation that attended the Nicene Council that had uh, either Hercules or Perseus as their Christ. Like I said, different religions had different Christs with different names. It's because they were all apocalyptic literature. They were not literal history. Constantine, by designating Jesus, which means the Hebrew God, Yah, of salvation, comes from the Hebrew Joshua. The stories, as I've gone over with you uh, for Sunday school for this year in Old Testament, the names of the characters have to do with the events in the stories those characters are involved in. And so the infamous one that Nelson botches, Jacob. He's born Jacob because he's holding on to the ankle of his brother Esau coming out of the womb. And so the story of Jacob is that he then usurps the birthright and blessing of Esau 
so that the seed of Messiah comes through Jacob and no longer Esau. Esau is denied the birth line, the bloodline, the Holy Grail of the Christ, who is Joseph in the Genesis story. And so Jacob's name is changed to the new name, Yah, Prince of God. And the author tells us this in the text with the giving of the new name. And so Nelson keeps perpetuating the white supremacist definition, Yah, Prince of or let God prevail. <laughs> let God prevail in your lives. Yeah, no. He created a new God for Mormons, which was a resurrection. Notice he never says ascension. Go back and listen. I caught on to that. He never ascends Jesus Christ. And if you don't understand what ascension is, you're unfamiliar with John when he's talking to his wife who had children by him saying woman touch me not for I have not yet ascended to my father and then there's the praise to the man ascended to heaven while earth lauds his fame apparently Joseph Smith has been resurrected already and ascended He's received his celestial glory, according to the song, the hymn, Praise to the Man. Hilarious. Not true, but hilarious. Because as apocalyptic literature, it's not literal history, so it's not literal events, which means the ascension is the coronation and ascension to the throne of the successor. The whole cross... Yeah, I've gone over that with you. It's X marks the spot in southern Illinois with the three days of darkness, the first and the third, specifically the cross in southern Illinois. The Tau symbol, the cross. And I went over in the last Sunday school lesson, which is going to be for this Sunday. And uh, for those of you on my Travis Wayne Good Cell, yeah, you have to go to TWG to get caught up on what you've been missing. <sighs> because the church is trying to assassinate me, as you guys were aware of, until January 21st, when I did the video, False Christ of the Great and Abominable Church church ordered YouTube to cancel my channel. It was wrong of them to do so. There's nothing wrong in that video. They chose to make something wrong and refused to allow it so that I can purposely miss the war and general conference, which was a whole grooming for polygamy event which I learned in advance on TWG. That's over 1,700 views. And so, Mormons of Joseph Smith were not Christian. Jesus did not appear to Joseph Smith, despite Nelson claiming over the pulpit of conference that he did in the first vision. It wasn't Jesus. Look it up. Do you not read? Are you not capable of reading the scriptures? Or are you puppets for the church just as Christians had been since Constantine until the Gutenberg Bible, when people were finally being able to read the Bible for themselves. 
Constantine chose the name Jesus, turned the Gospels into literal history, which then the Jews likewise turned the Old Testament, called the Tanakh, Torah writings, prophets, into literal history. And there were legitimate authors that can be dated uh, to actual people, but only so far back. The Torah cannot be substantiated by science. It's not literal history. But yet Christians, because of Constantine, and Jews and Islam have also been influenced with their religions by Constantine turning the Christ into Trinity, a three-in-one, incomprehensible non-matter essence, supernatural is what it's called. Supernatural by definition means not real. He created somebody not real. So apocalyptic literature, yeah, it has superheroes doing superhero stunts, you know, like Samson, superhuman strength. It's not real. There are no such people. It's not real. It's apocalyptic literature. They are symbolisms, types and shadows for the latter days. Apocalypse. Revelation. Book of Revelation is the book of Apocalypse. This is very simple, but if you get deceived by your church leaders, they take you away from the truth. Thus the tree of life, the paths of darkness, the mist of darkness, the filthy waters that you fall into. Yeah, those are by following false prophets and false Christs. The Book of Mormon is intended to be the iron rod to help Mormons on the path to the Jewish Christ, the Tree of Life, Jewish mysticism, the learning of the Jews, the language of the Egyptians. The learning of the Jews is Isaiah, Amen El, Emmanuel. That's his name. It means sun god of noonday. That's the Egyptian for Amun. Right there in our Book of Mormon. So yes, Jesus is in our Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith used Jesus in the Doctrine and Covenants. But we are supposed to understand Jesus in the context of the learning of the Jews, the language of the Egyptians. The Book of Mormon is not literal history. And so Nelson, by perpetuating Jesus of the Gospels by Constantine of Reformed Christians in the Catholic Church, yeah, he's preaching a false Christ to Mormons. He turned Joseph Smith into a Christian who believes in Jesus. When Joseph Smith clearly, if anybody can read, we have the Joseph Smith papers, the church made it available for all of us to expose the church as a fraud. But they don't expect you to read them. That's the whole point. They release them online, but don't expect you to actually do the research. There's lots and lots of pages and documents to go over. You have to actually search. Because the church won't pull out certain scriptures that were kept out of our Doctrine and Covenants. You know, like Relay Society, 17 March 1842. And the big one that I've been pointing out to you on TWG, 19 July 1840, Part B. And you'll read it, and you'll understand exactly why Brigham Young did not include it 
along with the Relief Society one, in his 1844 and then 1876 versions of the Doctrine and Covenants. And then you'll understand why Brigham Young removed the whole chapter on monogamy the year before he died, putting in his creation, claiming it was Joseph's, section 132. And you'll see why 131 is missing a certain discussion with a monogamous couple by Joseph Smith, and they can obtain exaltation. You can't have that if you're going to talk about polygamy is the law upon which the celestial kingdom is based in verse 1 of section 132. So you got to get that out. There's a whole bunch of truth waiting to be found in the Joseph Smith papers. The question is, are Mormons courageous enough to search Joseph Smith's words to learn the truth? To learn the truth about the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and why they will not celebrate Passover. They prefer Passion Week of Reformed Catholic Christians. Think about it.